Yeah, thanks. Um, and then welcome to my talk. I will today talk about data mapping in Precise, and data mapping is also mostly what I'm developing in Precise. Um, the talk is titled Flexible and Efficient Data Mapping for Simulation of Coupled Problems, and that's also, at least from a broader perspective, what I'm dealing with uh, in my PhD. And to get everyone kind of back on track or to get everyone on the same state, I usually start with a brief introduction on why we actually need data mapping in Precise. And I also used the same slides last year for this um, brief intro. So uh, in the most classical sense, we have in Precise two solvers we want to couple, uh, solver A and solver B. And now we want to couple these solvers along a coupling uh, surface in the middle. And usually we define a coupling interface in terms of the vertex locations, uh, which are then located here at the coupling interface. So from the precise perspective, uh, the interface would somewhat look like this. So we have solver A defining a coupling interface and solver B defining a coupling interface. And as we can see here, uh, both of these coupling interfaces are non-matching at the interface. And there might be a variety of reasons why we face such a problems, for example, different discretizations or different ge uh, geometry representations, but in essence, we have the problem that data lives on one side of our uh, mesh or of our coupling interface, and we want to get a solution on the other side. The question is now, how do we get there? And uh, to first get you an overview of how you can do this in Precise, um, yeah, I created kind of this small map, and we can categorize the mapping methods in Precise in two kind of high-level categories. So first of all, we have projection-based data mapping methods on the left side, and we have uh, kernel methods on the right side. And I also colorized here the methods which were added in yeah, either the last year or which will come in the near future. Um, if we use projection-based data mapping methods, um, and we think of the figure on the last side, uh, we are mainly restricted to nearest neighbor mapping, or, yeah. I mean, it's also the most simple data mapping method one can think of, because it simply assigns the spatially nearest neighbor of our input mesh to our output mesh. And all further extensions, which we see below here, they require additional input from the user side. So we have here a connectivity extension. So if we extend our um, map uh, our mesh by uh, connectivity between volumetric entities, so for example, tetrahedra or hexahedra, then we can perform a linear cell interpolation. Uh, Marcus mentioned it already. This was added in version 2.5 by Boris. Um, this is mainly meant for volume coupling. Um, if we look towards surface coupling, then we need to add surface connectivity. So considering a 3D scenario, we would just need to define uh, triangles and uh, quadrilaterals in order to uh, get the required, required connectivity for um, an extended nearest neighbor mapping. And while these two ma mapping methods here are extending in terms of topological information, we can also add additional data, um, which in essence is derivative data or gradient data in order to use a nearest neighbor gradient mapping, which was also added last year. So fundamentally different. I mean, uh, the mapping itself uh, for nearest neighbor and nearest neighbor gradient in, is in essence uh, the same. We just use the additional gradient data in order to get an improved interpolant on our output vertex. Um, completely different from these methods, we have our kernel methods. So we have on the one hand uh, the global RBF mapping methods, which we can either solve iteratively or in a direct fashion. And we have a partition of unity RBF methods, which we will talk about in the next few minutes. And for the user, we have now the main question, which mapping method do I select for my specific application? And in order to give you a feeling on how you can select or which criteria you have when you select a mapping method, I performed a small numerical experiment. Here I just took a unit square domain uh, overlapping, so of course two different um, representations, but both are a unit square, and have some sample data, which in this case is a Rosenbrock's function. It's just a well-known uh, function in order to evaluate mapping methods. And what I do now is uh, I map from my input mesh to my output mesh, and since I use an analytic function here, Rosenbrock's function, I can also immediately determine the error on our output mesh. 
And it's also worth noting that all computations are carried out in serial. And I created uh, these measurements using ASTE, just as a side note, because you will work with ASTE if you attend the mapping course on Thursday. And what we get now looks somewhat like this. Um, I don't claim that this is generally true, because if your setup might look differently, you might get slightly different results. But at least uh, from a uh, yeah, global trend, I think this is already a representative um, measure of our mapping methods in precise. So first of all, what do we see? We have here on the y-axis uh, the error of our mapping method. And on the x-axis, we have the runtime. Or in other words, we look here at performance and accuracy, which are mostly also the quantities of interest when talking about data mapping methods. And uh, please do not consider this axis to represent some physical absolute values. So I just want to put them um, or to compare them e uh, against each other. So what you can roughly say is maybe that um, one method is a few orders of magnitude better or you know, worse than another one. OK, but what do we see? So first of all, our ne nearest neighbor mapping method is by far the fastest one we have in precise. And this is probably also generally true, independent of the um, use case you have. Uh, but it's also the least accurate one. Um, if we put then more information into our method, uh, in terms of, for example, the linear cell interpolation or the nearest neighbor gradient mapping method, we, of course, get something more, more accurate without paying too much in terms of performance. And usually, then, we have our kernel methods, which are much more expensive in terms of computational cost, but they usually also deliver, deliver something more accurate. And throughout this talk, I would like to talk a bit about the kernel methods, uh, why we have these differences, and um, yeah, how to consider them. And to start off, I would like to briefly introduce um, kernel methods and what I mean by saying kernel methods. And for this, um, yeah, let's consider a sample input mesh. And this is actually also the input mesh I used for the measurements I showed before. So this is just a unit square. And we have also some sample data on our unit square, which is here a uh, Rosenbox function evaluated on a unit square. And what we have now is some arbitrary uh, or de desired output location on which we want to retrieve the solution of our function. And a general observation, if you now want to map data from the input mesh to the output mesh, would be something like, OK, I have close by data, which is probably very relevant in order to generate my interpolant on the output vertex. And I have less relevant values, which are further away from my desired output um, vertex. And if you put this a bit more in a mathematical formulation, then you already kind of have at least the key idea of kernel methods as we use them in precise, because kernel methods mostly rely on a kernel function. And a kernel function is, in our case, a radial basis function. And the radial, radial basis function is, in essence, just a way to measure distances. So I also put a, an example radial basis function here on the bottom. Um, so phi of x equals absolute value of x, which is um, a volume spline. You can also actually use it in precise. Um, yeah, and it just gives me an, um, a distance measure for my vertex locations between input and output. Um, <coughs> how then do radial basis function interpolation methods look like? In order to then compute solutions with radial basis function interpolations, uh, we usually use this formula. So we have s here, which is our desired output value. So this is an unknown value. Then we have a sum over all basis function. And as I already mentioned before, so the basis function here measures the distance between our output mesh vertex location. So x is always the location. And we compute the pairwise distance between all input mesh vertex locations. OK, these are all known values. Uh, the only thing which is not known here is our lambda. And lambda is a weighting factor. And OK, now we have two unknowns in this equation. So we have the output value, which we are actually looking for. And we have the weighting factor. And in order to define now or determine our weighting factor, we actually use what we call the interpolation condition, because there are locations in our domain where we actually know the solution which is exactly the input mesh vertices. 
So this is also what we kind of use here. So we have the input mesh vertex locations, xi, and we exactly want to represent um, this expression, our input values, um, at the location of our input mesh vertices. Okay, and in this equation, actually, the input values are known, uh, the locations of our input mesh are known, so we can actually rearrange the equation, and what we need to do, in essence, is solve this equation for lambda. And with this, we already kind of, um, yeah, or can already compute our global RBF mappings. So I wrote up here the equation we've seen before, and what we need to do, in essence, is solve this equation, and afterwards we can immediately evaluate the values on our output data, uh, output vertices. So what the global RBF mapping does, it does is it constructs a global matrix in order to solve these lambdas, and the global matrix is mostly already represented by this uh, RBF function. So this is um, input times so input time number of input vertices times number of input mesh vertices um, matrix. Uh, it's also um, a symmetric matrix, and if the radial basis function is positive definite, then this matrix is also positive definite. And um, the only thing which differs here is mostly the sparseness of this matrix, and the sparseness heavily depends on the selected kernel function. So I can select uh, kernel functions with a very small support radius or a, um, a small kernel, then I only have non-zero entries uh, for the surrounding area, and if I select a large kernel function or a support radius which is very large, then I also get a lot of non-zero entries for my mapping matrix and I essentially end up with a dense matrix. On the other hand, the partition of unity method works fundamentally different. <coughs> here we first split the domain in a number of subdomains, which I called here M. And it's also kind of showcased here on the right side. So we have our uh, split into several partitions, which are here, at least the partition centers are indicated by these spheres. And we have the partition size indicated by this circle around these centers. And what we do now is we associate a weighting function to each of these partitions. And we require that, that if we sum over all partitions, then we want this weight to be equal to one. And what we do now is we construct local RBF interpolants, just as we've seen before, for each subdomain. And in order to get our global solution, the, we can simply um, yeah, weight our solution with our weight or weighting function and sum over all partitions. So this might sound a bit cryptic, so I um, created a small comparison, which is the example we've seen so far all the time. So what happens for either of these methods? So for our partition of unity me uh, method, we go along, we split this domain into, yeah, in this case, 16 subdomains. So we need to create the partitioning uh, in Precise or in any other software where I want to implement this method. Then I solve 16 RBF systems inside of each partition where each of the systems has only a subset, subset of vertices, so for example, 13 input vertices on average here. Then I evaluate my weighting function in each of these partitions, and I sum over all my, all my partitions in order uh, to retrieve my global solution. On the other hand, the global RBF mapping method would construct one single mapping matrix, matrix out of this, with size 153 times 153, because we have 153 input mesh vertices. So in this case, we took the nodes as input mesh vertices. And in order to get a feeling of how this affects our mapping method, I brought two user examples. So the first one was actually provided by Kame, who will also talk later today. And here we consider a volume-coupled muscle fiber. So the geometry is also showcased here on the right. We have a muscle fiber, which is, I think, a biceps muscle. And we have another volumetric mesh, uh, which is meshed differently, but the geometry is, of course, the same. Um, and we have this geometry in two different setups. We have one coarse case. So this is the first row, and we have one fine case, which is the lower row here. 
Um, so the coarse case consists of, I think, around 10,000 vertices and the fine case of around 50,000 vertices or something like this. And we execute now our mapping for different number of core counts. So this was all performed on a node level. Um, we started off by four, or here it was eight cores, and then um, doubled the number of cores for each new experiment. And what do we compare here? We compare the partition of Inti method with the iterative RBF solving and the uh, direct RBF solving as it is implemented in precise right now. I mean, the partition of Unity method is not yet um, merged to the main branch of precise, but as we have developed it right now. Um, and then we have here the initialization cost. So this is something we need to compute once in each, in each simulation. For example, our matrix assembly, and for the direct method, we compute a matrix decomposition. And if we would use preconditioners, this is something we can compute once per simulation. And then we have per coupling cost. So for example, we need to solve the system with new data. Then we have yeah, kind of the online cost or per coupling iteration cost. OK, what do we see? So first of all, uh, noteworthy is that our direct RBF method apparently does not exploit any parallel cores because the yeah, computational cost in order to execute them is mostly the same. And this is also what we can kind of expect because the direct RBF solver in precise is not really computed in parallel. It just uses a gather scatter approach to gather all data on a single rank. Then we compute the solution and then we scatter it back on all distributed ranks. Uh, so in this sense, we cannot really exploit the um, resources we add in order to compute the solution here. On the other hand, the RBF iterative solver uses Petsy under the hood. So this is really something where we can uh, compute our mapping in parallel. And this is also what we can see. So for more resources, we go faster and faster with our mapping method. But it's also note, uh, worth noting that on the online phase, so once we have our coupling, um, so once we have our matrix decomposition for the direct solver, uh, we are very fast in the online phase. So because the direct solver essentially performs a backward substitution in the online phase um, in order to compute the mapping, and this is very fast. Whereas for the iterative method, we still need to perform all the iterations until we reach convergence in each coupling iteration. Um, but yeah, most important, of course, is that the partition of unity method performs much better. Uh, we, I mean, for all these methods, um, we are a factor of around 100, and in the per coupling iteration cost, we are maybe even more efficient. But this might also depend a bit on how large your case is, because, for example, if you go to very small cases, the direct solving with the RBF method might also be faster. And the other case I want to showcase um, was contributed by uh, Yusuke Takashi, which was lately a guest researcher at the University of Stuttgart. And they do uh, the re-entry or simulating re-entry phases of um, yeah, these elastic membranes. So we have actually a surface coupling of an elastic structure with a fluid. And what we compare here is now the behavior of our iterative RBF solution strategy as it uh, is yeah, used in precise right now and the partition of unity method. And we actually compute exactly the same mapping. And the only thing we change in each of these setups is uh, the kernel function or the radial basis function. This is what we see here on the left side. So in the precise configuration, this is usually called a compact polynomial C0 or C2, C4, C6. Um, so these functions are also called Wendland functions. And now the question, I guess, for uh, some of you are what changes if I change the number here of the basis function. In essence, I can expect the solution to be more accurate if I select a higher C4, so C6 or something. But I can also expect the mapping matrices to be um, more ill-conditioned. And this is also kind of what we see in this figure, because if we use an iterative solution strategy in order to solve these systems, um, the required number of solver iterations for our iterative solver increase by a lot. 
So for example, for the C0 function, so I used here exactly the same configuration. I only changed the basis function. I, use, uh, I, I needed 2,500 iterations. And for the C2 function, I already hit the threshold of 10,000 iterations on, uh, at which presets will actually abort the solution or the solving um, procedure. Um, and on the other hand, what we see is that the partition of unity method does not really care about the condition and does not really care about is meant in terms of uh, the time required in order to solve the system because we can locally use very efficient direct solvers. Um, of course, what we also see is that at some point the accuracy gain won't be that big anymore because in essence the partition of unity method will also suffer from conditionings. But at least in terms of runtime, uh, we are not dependent on the conditioning of our mapping matrices. And in preset version 3, so I only want to brief, briefly mention this here because I think Frederick will also talk about it tomorrow. Um, we want to rearrange a bit how you configure these kind of methods in precise. So right now what you do in order to configure your mapping method is you write mapping colon and then RBF minus the basis function. And yeah, this somehow led to uh, quite a lot of attributes which did not fit into this tag um, and it does not really fit the need uh, or the complexity we face here. And in precise version 3, we want to handle things now differently. Namely, we want to distinguish at according to the applied solver we use in order to solve our RBF system. So we want to introduce three tags, um, one for the global iterative solver, one for the global direct solver, and one for the partition of Unity. But we also want to create an alias tag in order to kind of hide this complexity from the user. So we want to kind of take your input information in terms of which hardware resources do I have and how big is your problem. And then we want to default to something which just is, according to our best knowledge, uh, a good fit uh, in order to solve this problem. But still allowing you to um, select either of these methods if you really know what you do and if you really like to select either of these methods. And this was mostly what I wanted to talk about in terms of kernel methods. And as a last uh, kind of outlook uh, into the more future projects we are investigating right now, uh, I added here um, a snapshot of the top 500 list. So for those of you who do not know this, um, the top500.org lists the 500 most um, powerful supercomputers in the world. And this here is now the list of November 2022. And what, I, what do I want to say here? If you look a bit more in detail into the hardware specifications here, we see that most of these supercomputers nowadays rely on the use of accelerator cards or on GPUs. And this led now to a kind of the question, can we use GPUs or accelerator cards in precise and how can we do this? Um, so we have essentially two scenarios. One is we want to use the accelerator card in our coupled codes. So precise runs on a CPU as usual and we have kind of a restricted hardware access. Precise cannot exploit the GPU, but we still need to handle the memory transfers from GPU to CPU and stuff like that. Um, this was also already done in the past, so if you have a similar setup, you might be interested in either of these publications here. This is one scenario we are considering and investigating right now, although investigating means, in essence here, just measuring timings on what happens inside uh, the coupled simulation. And the scenario two, which is more on our side here, is what happens if we use accelerator cards in precise and yeah, what's meant by this is we have, of course, uh, embarrassingly data parallel computations we do in precise and we can, of course, exploit GPUs over CPUs um, in order to speed up things and fully exploit the hardware we have available. And we have currently a related master thesis running by Timu, who's today not here. Um, but I wanted to give you some kind of uh, a teaser on what we will work on throughout this year. And with this, I also summarize and conclude my talk. So 
I introduced a bit the data mapping methods we have in Precise. And as you have seen, they differ significantly in terms of runtime and performance. And what we can say about the partition of unity method, as it will come in the version 3 release, is that it's comparable in terms of runtime, comparing it to our existing RBF methods. But especially for large cases, um, the partition of unity method can boost your coupled simulation. And in terms of the configuration, or from the user perspective, we want to allow as much as possible, but of course, require as little as possible. So if you just want to say, precise, give me something which works, then we also want to allow this. And as an outlook, um, this is what I mentioned before, we are currently investigating coupled simulation, simulations on GPUs, for example, offloading our kernel methods onto the GPUs. And we are also, I guess, or I hope, um, investigating throughout, the, throughout this year uh, dynamic data mapping methods, um, particularly interesting for particle coupling or um, maybe even for adaptive meshes. Let's see. Um, yeah, and this concludes my talk. Thanks a lot, and I'm um, open for questions. Yes. Or what do you mean by weight functions for the partition of unity method? Um, so your wait a second. So so the question was if I can recycle the weight function. So you are talking about this W here, right? Yeah, so this W stays constant if your mesh stays constant, and this is also what we exploit in the current implementation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, the configuration will look like this. Uh, but you will have all four choices here. So we you have the choice to select mapping RBF, which will then kind of be the alias and the auto selection of the most appropriate mapping method. But of course, if you use either of these three, then it will always do the same thing. Then there is no auto selection. So to answer the question, um, yeah, you can also select the mapping method yourself and it should or will behave always in the same way. There were further questions here. Yes. Um, is there a way to get the optimal radius of the current function, so rule of bump, or how is it to get the application? Um, for the global RBF mappings, we have a kind of a guideline in our documentation which says something like um, select your support radius such that you cover three to five vertices in the radial direction. But if you look at this example here, then things become very interesting because um, yeah, the mesh is highly non-uniformly distributed and you have a hard time selecting a support radius here. Um, the partition of unity method is in such a way a bit more user-friendly because you, can, you will always have a global supported um, basis function. Um, what I mostly do right now is uh, I select a compact kernel and then I estimate kind of the bounding box of, of my domain in order to um, select my basis function. So it's kind of scaling down my basis function to the domain size I have, but this is at the moment only uh, an initial best guess to do this. Um, the more elegant answer would probably be you can use Aster in order to get a really yeah, kind of proven um, good mapping configuration, but um, yeah, it depends a bit on how accurate we want to go and how far. And there was another question, I think. Yes. Uh, I was pleased with the session of that, uh, which was a certain order, but how should I choose the information so that I observe this order? Yeah, so that's a difficult question because the mapping method itself here are, or they have a higher convergence order, 
or you can select them such that they have a higher convergence order, but it will still be a different convergence order than your solver because the, the space the mapping is living in is a different one. And yeah, so in the experimented experiments I carried out so far, it was not really possible to preserve the higher order convergence of your solvers throughout the coupling interface. Um, yeah, so not really possible as a, yeah. Yeah, we have to distinguish between the convergence order of our mapping method, which can be higher order, but it's not kind of for conforming higher order with the convergence order of your solver. And maybe last one, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, there is additional time required for the gather scatter, but it's so minor that you won't notice it here. So this is also only within a node level, so maybe if you go on a massively parallel system, of course, you will notice, and of course, at some point, I would assume if you spend so much resources, then your problem size also becomes exceedingly large in order to solve it with a direct method. But uh, to answer the question, yes, the gather scatter will have an impact on the performance, but for this uh, sys system size, so this was a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, I think, um, yeah, you won't notice because the overall time required is so large. Mm -hmm. All right, so...